project, uh, Trinity River project in Fort Worth that is developing a whole sustainable community in the midst of what used to be part of the floodplain and still is part of the floodplain, but with the river directed a little bit differently. And then, of course, some real geothermal um, heat in New Zealand. If you go on to slide two, um, if you look out on the internet, watch television, go to a convention, you'll see a plethora of green items to buy and mountains of green information to absorb. Uh, green wash is everywhere. Um, but this presentation is on how to approach or design a sustainable building. This presentation is not based on any policies or laws or, or army guidance. Um, it's taking a step back from these policies and, and looking at what is truly sustainable, um, how you might um, uh, design a facility or construct a facility to be truly sustainable. Um, you could do this for your neighbor down the street. You could do it for the government in, in your day-to-day -day job. Um, this presentation was developed into res a response from a, um, just some comments I saw go by. Oftentimes I hear people talk about their project and folks want to know right away, gee, what renewable features do you have in your project? And sustainability is so much more than just a renewable feature or renewable energy that I thought it was good to maybe step back and take a look at sustainability. Um, oftentimes people get hung up in the policies as well, and so I thought that this approach to take a, a look at what sustainability is would truly help. Um, at the bottom, you can see on the left-hand side some green, in quotations, lawnmower and trimmer that I pulled off of a website. Um, and then on the right-hand side is what I would consider the more really green lawnmower and trimmer. So just a, a little piece of humor there. On slide three, what is sustainability? Sustainability is the ability to capture, I mean, capacity to endure. Um, it's making sure that um, we can survive as a, a race and our well-being depends either directly or indirectly on our natural environment. Um, create, sustainability creates and maintains the conditions under which we can do that so that we're in harmony, so that we exist not for this generation but for many more generations in the future. And anyone who's been doing sustainability knows it incorporates social, economic, and other requirements. Thus, we do a lot of thinking socially, and we do a whole lot of life cycle cost analysis to see what's the best economic thing to do. Sustainability is making sure we have what we need to continue, water, materials, and resources. On the right-hand side, I have two pictures. You can debate which is the more sustainable. Um, I think both are fairly sustainable. You have a hut with a solar cooker, and then you have New York City, which is technically one of the most sustainable in the world due to the amount of people that use mass transportation to commute and the fact that their living footprint is so small. So sustainability, where do we start? And if we're expected to design sustainable, sustainable buildings. And if we go on, I'm going to um, break my, this approach down into three steps. And the first step I'm proposing is that we do things that cost us nothing and that have an impact into saving water and energy. So they save water, energy, improve our environment, and cost nothing, which I'm saying is better than net zero. So um, one of the first things you can do, and you'll recognize some of these, if you use site planning, good site planning, it costs you little to do it. It actually might save you money on utilities, so you have less utilities if you're able to design something more compactly in a smaller area on an installation. It helps with your um, force protection because you can create this smaller installation and pull back from the perimeter of your installation. Um, so doing smart planning really helps, and in my mind is better than net zero. It not only saves on those utility runs, um, in the immediate when it's installed, but it saves on maintenance later on and replacement co costs later on. So to do that smart planning, you locate buildings close together in a complex. If buildings are going to have users that use the same group of buildings, 
you locate them together. So if you're going to put dormitories, dining hall, and workspace for that unit together on an installation, you put them close so that the people that work there and live there can go between the facilities in a walkable manner and don't have to use government vehicles or personal vehicles. They may not even have to own a personal vehicle, and it helps save on greenhouse gases. You'll note on the right-hand side is the community center plan for Andrews Air Force Base, which is right outside D.C. in Maryland. And they have been shrinking their footprint over at Andrews to create this compact kind of development. So you'll see there it has the BX, the commissary, a lot of the community support buildings. It has dormitories on the upper right-hand side. There's actually family housing down um, to the bottom and to the left. Uh, within about a two-block area is their workspaces to the right, and also the cream-colored buildings, the kind of funny ones, is visiting quarters and the new Air Force Conference Center that is there. So this complex is what I would consider a very compact um, designed um, site plan and a good thing to do for sustainable buildings. Um, also, you locate, to do sustainable planning, you locate buildings near mass transit, you locate buildings to share parking. Again, if you look at that Andrews Air Force Base example, parking is shared between movie theaters, the BX, the commissary, um, workspaces. Uh, there's no individual parking lot, per se, for a certain building, but each, each building shares depending on the time period they'll use. And then site planning also locates buildings that share spaces. So you can share, say, a, a education room in a chapel with a close-by education center. Or you can share a conference center um, someplace and use it for education purposes. So buildings that are better than net zero do that kind of sharing so you get 24-hour access to the uh, buildings and you use them as much as you can so that you're not building redundant places to hold um, events. And then but finally, in sustainable planning, you create walkable communities, um, which helps people from a health-wise perspective. It also helps sustainability. It helps reduce greenhouse gases, um, et cetera. We go on then. Um, on an overall building standpoint, what can you do that is better than net zero, that costs you little, but um, saves you in dollars over the life cycle of a building? You can reduce the building size by eliminating unneeded spaces. I've often taken plans that were done by others and simply looked at them and reworked, and we're able to save 2 to 5 percent, which isn't a huge amount in the square footage needed for a building, but is is, has a large impact over the lifetime of that building. In warmer climates, you use outdoor spaces for um, spaces that would normally be inside. So you may have an outside break area. I've been in buildings in Texas, government buildings in Texas, where they don't have any hallways, but the rooms are simply arranged around a center courtyard, and people use that as the outside hallway to circulate. Um, they've also used outside spaces for commander's calls and outside spaces even for, for classrooms. So I would submit that when we have a center of standardization floor plan, really there should be a look at those to say, hey, when we have um, a building in a warm climate, perhaps there's ways we can further save on the amount of building that we have to build. Maybe there's ways to use that outside um, space to, to uh, substitute for hallways and, and other areas. That's certainly a net zero. It also gets people out in the sunlight and helps their overall health. Um, and then, of course, um, for an overall building, you want to co-use spaces. You, um, I had seen a battalion headquarters that had a conference room. It was a training battalion. The conference room was wired for SuperNet and the conference room is ready to use to do war planning. Well, those people training in that battalion headquarters didn't do that at all. In fact, they were almost never going to use that conference room. So I would propose that you need to take a look at spaces and co-use spaces. 
take a look at standard designs and see if there's a, a reason to take a, a room out. Now maybe in the example I gave, they were later on going to switch and have that battalion headquarters be part of an actual combat unit. And maybe that room was required later on, so maybe it made sense to leave in there. But certainly those kind of questions need to be asked, and, and we need to co-use and get as skinny as we can on, on building floor plates. Um, building less is sustainable. Building only what you need is sustainable. We also need to take a look at our designs and see if we have unnecessary roof spaces. And I'm not talking about the roof space on the top of the roof. I'm talking about the attic spaces underneath. If you look, some of our installations require a sloped roof that ends up with a good amount of space between the actual roof itself and the actual ceiling that is in the spaces beneath. And so maybe we need to take a look if there's spaces such as that. Maybe it's better off being used in the space underneath and giving a sense of height to the space, doing something architectural in that space. Or maybe it's better off if we go with a slightly lower roof slope. Or maybe there's another use that can be up there. I've seen uh, larger buildings that have used that attic space as um, overflow office space. So they knew they were a function that in the long run, particularly a cyber function, that might grow. And they purposefully made it so that they could grow into that attic office space. But anyway, the roof space or the attic space that is up there needs to, to be thought out. The same thing we can do with our mechanical spaces in our buildings. As we, in the rest of this presentation, get more sustainable, as we add more insulation to our um, walls and floor and roof and foundation, our mechanical systems might be able to be smaller. And if they are indeed smaller than maybe what we've traditionally put in for that mechanical space, needs to be reviewed and looked at, maybe we can have some smaller mechanical units. Or perhaps maybe not. Maybe um, due to the complexity of mechanical units, you need a little more space. But at least we need to be looking at and thinking about sustainability in those things. If you then go on to the next slide, better than net zero also occurs in building orientation. How you orient a building on the site to take advantage of sun, shade, wind. How you use the sun to warm spaces. Uh, we'll have a picture of a building later on that's an older brick building in Minneapolis. And it's good to use that thermal lag to actually warm up a space. And then how you use a building to funnel the local wind. So if you're in an arid location, you can actually locate the wings of a building, slant them a little bit toward each other, and get some nice volume of wind coming through during the summer to cool people off. You can use it at night to cool and, and um, essentially uh, air out buildings uh, during the evening. On the right-hand side um, is the Enrail building in Golden, Colorado, and two views of it. You'll notice that the top view, there's some window shading. On the bottom, there's no window shading. Or, or just a little bit of window shading. And this is talking about in hot climates, you use the building to protect from the sun. Um, and in other locations where you want the sun to come in, you don't protect that. And I'm sorry, I spelled north wrong from the north winds. Um, but giving um, different fenestration um, solutions to different parts of the building is sustainable. And I would say it's, it's a better than net zero. You'll also notice on the top one at the NREL building, they shaded the bottom part of the window, which is the part that the people sitting nearest the window on the inside can see out of, so that they don't have glare problems. And then the top part of the window actually is the light that penetrates into the interior of the building, so that the people a little further back can get some sun in the building. So different ways of, of working with your fenestration, working with your building envelope to get better than the net zero. Um, then if we talk about building materials, you select building materials appropriate to the climate. So in the north, a darker color, something that absorbs the sun, allows you to have that thermal lag where the sun heats up the outside skin during the day. And then in the spring and the fall, when that heat starts to come through about 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the evening, 
you can then either open your windows to air out the building, or if it is in December in the winter time, you leave the windows shut and that building just continues to help heat up the inside of that building as the sun starts to, to set. So using your building materials, select the appropriate color. If you're in the south, that's why the south paints buildings like colors and to reflect a lot of sun. Um, I propose that even nowadays you can, uh, technology such as it is, you can get a building roof that looks brown so it fits in with an architectural palette for an installation, but yet it reflects the sun similar to a light colored roof. I would also propose that you and your work with the installations, or if we have anyone at MCOM on the line, um, have an installation color palette, and that should be selected to be sustainable and to be historically compatible with the buildings that are there. So select colors that are appropriate and use that on that palette of materials, that palette of colors on all of your buildings. Most installations I know have that and it's given to you. Sometimes we see that as a barrier, but that's really helping us to be very sustainable in choosing materials that work well for the installation. Um, I would also propose that we use renewable materials that cost the same or less um, and make sure the materials are properly um, installed. If you look over on the right hand side, you can see a bit of rigid installation, insulation that was at a project that Lindsay and I went out and looked at last year and um, looks like we got a little bit of installation issues going on and thus I didn't tell you where that project um, was. Also when you use renewable materials, look at the life of the materials and choose the one that has the lowest life cycle based on that whole life cycle analysis. If we look at site materials, better than net zero, so things that cost us very little but yet have a huge impact, are one, using low impact development principles and from an installation wide perspective. I would propose that to do a truly sustainable building, you don't just look at what happens on the site that you're given for your, your project, but that you should really approach the installation and say, you know, we need to look at these lid principles from across the site, or at least an area-wide perspective. It doesn't make sense to try and, and trap water for each individual site, building site, when perhaps a, um, a more area-wide approach would, would help the installation. So ask the installation if they don't provide for you what they're doing from a little broader perspective. Obviously to be sustainable you disturb the site as little as possible. You use native plants, indigenous plants that use less water. Um, hopefully there will be no only a one year um, watering irrigation period and then no water for those indigenous plants. You consider grass areas with gradual maintenance reduction. And I've seen this where you may have uh, a lawn area. It then is near the edge of a base. And so you have just outside um, grassy, more natural areas out that after that. And you, you graduate the height of the grass to which it's maintained. And you graduate the type of grass. So it might right up next to the building be what we're used to as far as a, a turf grass, but it very quickly changes into a prairie grass or whatever kind of grass that you have on the outside. Um, and so there is less maintenance um, and uh, more sustainable. You reduce paving and sidewalks where possible and use permeable, permeable paving where possible. So hopefully these site considerations with the planning considerations before really help drive you to that sustainable building. And then finally, on the interior of the building, you select finishes that require less maintenance. You know, a carpeted building requires someone to come in and to run the sweeper every couple days at least, um, and takes longer to maintain than a tile um, or than a terrazzo or than some other wood material. And so not only is your selection of flooring material have an impact on the initial cost, have an impact on the replacement, but has an impact on the maintenance cost that goes on. And I would propose that for most locations we can get by with a little more durable, 
longer lasting um, hard surface than, than going to carpet. Um, I propose we use renewable materials that cost the same or less than non-renewable, perform the same function, have the same lifespan. Um, also, I would propose using neutral or natural color palettes for the interior. So if you look at the NREL building to the right and to the kitchen at the right, um, they both have very neutral gray, very neutral wood tones up in the NREL building, some whites. And what gives the color to the inside is the finishes um, and the uh, furnishings that are put into the spaces. Um, I would even go as far as to say for um, a government facility, you should also have systems furniture that is neutral. The um, industry, the interior design industry purposefully changes what are the in colors every three to five years and they help drive what is deemed to be a requirement for new finishes and furnishings when in fact the um, material that is already there has a perfectly good um, life expectancy of a few more years. So for instance, the kitchen at the bottom is 25 years old. Um, looks pretty good for being 25 years old and I think could probably stay around for a little longer. Try and use a neutral palette and material that match the architectural style and time period of the building. That will help take that interior finish material through a lot longer lifespan to really the material gives out on you and not the color. And again, I push for an installation-wide color palette. So maybe there are three to four different interior schemes that are selected. They have a little bit of interchangeability in them. And then an installation can use them in pretty much all of their office spaces. Um, they have same kind of color palette for their bathroom spaces. Um, it is an easy way to make maintenance repairs. Maintenance um, crews in your DPW only have to have a certain kind of tile, a certain kind of wall covering, a certain kind of pink color on hand and they can easily go and touch up and, and make repairs. So in my mind, these things are pushing the life cycle of the um, buildings. They're reducing the costs. They're having a better impact on our environment and they're truly better than net zero. And finally, on electrical and plumbing, being in this first step better than net zero, is the electrical and plumbing system. So we shape buildings to allow natural light. You can see on the right hand side is daylighting in the Taubman Museum in, in Roanoke. We model the building to within means. We still have to meet the mission of the people out there, but we model the building to get the most efficient um, shape considering daylighting, heat loss, or air conditioning, the heat gain, whichever um, season that we're in. We use natural lighting where possible, use task lighting, um, and have very uh, low levels of general lighting. Um, in classified spaces, I've done a couple of very highly classified spaces, and use translucent panels. So we don't want for people to particularly be able to see into those kind of buildings, but I would still say they can get some natural light. They can feel when it goes from daytime to nighttime in those buildings by using a translucent panel. Installing motion sensors um, is a good way to be um, more sustainable. And I would use the same philosophy on both the electrical and the plumbing as I proposed on the interior finishes. And that is that you have an installation wide selection of fixture types so that replacement fixtures or bulbs, et cetera, um, you have to keep less in hand and, and on stock at the installation in the DPW level. Um, and then obviously consider a mechanical system that uses less water if you model it and, and it, it works. Um, those are all ways to be more sustainable. So those, oh, I'm sorry, the very last and most important is to get users involved. We ha all have energy goals in some of our policies and I would say often we leave the users out of that equation. So we go ahead and try and reach the 30%, the 40%, the 65%, and we try and do it all on the backs of the building. 
And we need to rely on our users. We're reaching a point where they should help us uh, with that. Um, one of the ways to do that is to wire your building so that you can actually see what the building is using versus the users. Um, and then you um, help them, encourage them to um, save uh, electricity and water. Um, at a, a base that I was at previously, we started just a very simple um, campaign, mm -hmm. energy saving campaign, had notices come up on the computers when people logged on in the morning and went home in the afternoon that reminded them to turn off computers, turn off lights, etc. Actually had the centrally um, controlled computers, which was probably 90% of the base. When you went home at the end of the evening, you left the computer on, they did all the updates, they remotely turned off your computer. We calculated it saved probably, there were about 30,000 people on the base, saved about a million dollars a year in um, electrical uh, costs with a lot of people there having uh, multiple computers. So, um, and you can also have competitions once you wire your building uh, to measure what the users use versus what the building use. And, you know, maybe you have a barracks competition and the floor with the best or the building with, uh, you know, best energy savings, I don't know, gets a pizza party or something. Um, so anyway, I think we need to rely a whole lot more on our users and feed them into the equation. Um, we need to make the environment as efficient as we can for them. Our wages are the biggest cost to DOD, and therefore we need to make our people the most efficient that they can be, and then turn around and rely on them to help us do a part of the rest of the saving. Um, oh, and one thing I wanted to mention, at the very bottom, ask your users to evaluate their processes. I was designing a DFAC for Fort Lee and um, noticed that we just could not meet those energy goals. Um, we then looked at the biggest um, load. The biggest load were the fryers in the building. And so we um, then asked uh, the um, person that was in charge of the dormitories for the entire army, um, asked him, could we take out a fryer? And he said, oh, I've never thought about it. He then looked at his menu and he went, yeah, we can cut out some of the greasy food, help with our health um, situation, and we can also save on energy. So I would um, propose to your users that they evaluate their processes. They might be able to help you out in being more sustainable and saving energy. Next, step two. So that was step one. And step one, I would contend that if you just take that simple approach that I'm going to do, what is costs me nothing to do and saves money, you have hit a huge percentage of what you have to design in a building. You've hit um, your walls, you've hit your roof, you've hit the amount of square footage that you have to have, you've done a lot of your site planning, um, you've just hit a very large percentage and probably saved, you know, the example that I gave with um, just the knowledge campaign, we were able to save between 5 and 10 percent of energy usage on the base. If you knock off another 2 to 5 percent in square footage that you save by actually looking at what things you have to put inside a building versus outside and save that. And then if you do some other uh, minor things, you're probably up around the 20 percent saving and you've not put any extra money into designing the building except for thought process and, and you've um, saved a good amount of energy. So that's step one. Step two is then you actually look at what savings features you have to pay for and how they can reduce the life cycle cost. And I would say step two in designing a sustainable building is you look at things that have a positive impact over the lifespan of the building that do not require or require very little routine maintenance and that have essentially no moving parts and once you put them in place, they stay that way. So we're talking about the insulation in the walls, the insulation in the roof, the foundation insulation, all those things that cost you a little bit of money, but their life cycle cost effectiveness is huge. Um, so what would those things be? Um, first of all is some site 
um, features. So if you live in a temperate climate, it's those trees. And yeah, the trees do cost you more to uh, plant, and they cost you a little bit to clean up on the leaves afterwards. But they shade your windows in the summer. And in temperate climate, they allow light to come in in the winter. And they, their payoff is well worth their planting. If you have a cold climate, you would use an unconditioned vestibule to provide an extra layer between the outside and the inside. The same, time, the same way if you're in a hot climate, you use that same kind of vestibule to um, reduce the air conditioning loss. And you'll see there on the left-hand side is a vestibule in Washington, D.C. And I apologize, I forget where I took the picture. Um, and then on the right-hand side is the Wiseman Museum by Geary in Minneapolis. But the idea is you do those little things. They're there for the life of the building, and they really pay off. Next on our list of things to do that cost us a little but do a lot, um, you look at the most life cycle cost effective wall, roof, floor, and foundation insulation. You consider if you're in an extremely cold or hot climate, triple pane windows, and you model it to see if it'll work. You choose an exterior material that will have a long thermal lag. And the one on the right is perhaps uh, an overdone example. It's the Alamo. You go in there during the day, and it's extremely cool. That stone heats up on the outside. Um, and the heat doesn't come through until well into the evening when the windows can be opened and the building flushed out if you need. Or if it's winter, you just keep that heat trapped in there. Of course, they did that more for protection than they did for thermal lag. But anyway, it's a fun example. Um, you select exterior materials that require no maintenance. So you select brick, integrally colored CMU, stone, Anything that is integrally colored, meaning that if you break off a piece, you got the color still coming through. That way, weed whackers, vehicles plowing into the building, nicking off the corner, an errant soldier doing something, whenever you nick up that building, it's not like uh, EFIS, the old EFIS, where you nick it off and you got to call a guy out to repair it, and then you got water damage while the water seeps into it before you get the repair done. Buildings that are made of integrally colored pieces just perform way better, more sustainable, and the additional cost is minuscule. And then, of course, you select roofing materials with a long warranty period. That warranty, long warranty period means that the manufacturer is comfortable that their product will last a long time. And certainly, that's a good sustainable thing to do. It's much better than a roof with a very short warranty period where you're up there replacing the roof again. The next is kind of something we don't think of often, structural system. So if you're designing a structural system and you can provide a little bit more flexibility for approximately the same cost, consider it. Um, this is probably a professional judgment, but I would say open spaces allow you to do more. There's a lot of barracks projects I've seen where we designed and built them to meet a very specific standard. Lo and behold, the tri-service standard changed. And then we're in there trying to take down CMU walls that are structural and, and move plumbing and things around to, to get a different design and a different layout. So even though most people don't think of a structural system as being sustainable, I think there are opportunities where it can help in sustainability. And then, of course, we have water and electrical features. Um, save on water with fixtures that turn off when the user's not present. Um, it'd even be fun that maybe they push a button, it goes, it turns off. Um, sometimes many of us stand in front of the, the sink waiting to trigger that um, light that turns on the water. So maybe some thought in there, but I definitely think the ones that turn off are good. Use air rated fixtures were required, I mean were appropriate. Um, select fixtures that require little maintenance. Um, use efficient fixtures, both electrical and water. Low task low lighting with task lighting, uh, light bulbs with long lives, et cetera. And then again, wire the electrical system to allow occupant loads to be monitored separately. I think these are things that are, are very much in our vernacular. Um, then finally is step three. And step three is what most people jump to as step one. And I would propose that when you design a sustainable building, 
you walk through those other two steps first, so the things that cost us nothing and have a bang for the buck that are better than net zero, the things that cost us a little bit, last the entire life of the building, require almost no maintenance, and um, provide a real good payback are the things that you do first. And just a bit more on, on things that require no maintenance. It is possible to design an exterior of a building that will last 10 to 15 years with no maintenance. You choose an integrally colored masonry material. You choose the long warranty period roof. On the trim, you use um, metal that has been uh, with the color uh, pre, I'm having a mind glip, but with the color already done at the factory, factory finished metals. Um, no paint that's applied to the building uh, when you um, on site. So everything is pre-done in the factory, so it's got a real good finish. Those buildings you can put up and, and they stay working for you know, 10, 15 years before you have to go out and do maintenance. That should be what we're striving for. So you do all that, then when you get to this step three, you're down to the pieces of the building that are either um, mechanically oriented, that have moving parts, or you are down to the pieces of the building that are simply there uh, for appearance sake. Um, if you think about it, if you do steps one and two, you've really got the exterior skin of the building done. You've got almost all of the inside of the building done. You've got the predominance of the water and the electrical fixtures in place. And the pieces that then fall into this last category where I'm asking you to be judicious with the building features are really a small amount of features. Also, by the time you've done the steps previous to this, you've selected the most efficient insulation, et cetera, you are probably saving up to 30, 40 percent energy savings, um, probably almost up to um, certainly 100 percent of the exterior water usage and probably another good, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 30 percent of the water by the time you reach this step three. And the things to be judicious on are interior finishes that are um, that change often. So I'm saying use carpet as little as possible. Use only required for noise control and function. Select it in a neutral location and don't use it for frequently traveled areas. Select your flooring based on the life cycle cost analysis. So maybe that nicer floor and you'll see there the Roanoke Hotel has a very nice um, terrazzo-ish stone. I forget what's exactly there nice wall finishes. Those have been there for over 100 years. They'll stay there for another 100. Uh, that's really a, a good life cycle cost. Now, we're not costing on 100 years in the government. We're using the 40-year um, lifespan for analysis, but still, it's, it's a good example. And then, of course, the other two rooms that you see in there have the wood floors, which is the area rugs, so that the wood floor stays forever and has a good life cycle to it. And now you'll see on the next slide, slide 21, if you have systems with mechanical parts, so we're talking about the mechanical system, um, and anything else that has moving parts, I would say, first of all, take a look and see if it needs to have a motorized. If it doesn't, try and use a hand um, uh, option. So items that have motors, only use motors where required. So if you have a hand crank on a window, if you have other things, look at something that is mechanical but not powered by a motor if possible. And then once you determine, okay, I've got to use that motorized system, I've got to use the fans, I've got to do those, you select manufacturers with a long track record. You um, consider using the same types of systems across the base to save on parts. On that track record for the uh, manufacturer, you um, ask for other installations that they've had. You check to see how those have been going. You talk with both the owner and the um, maintenance um, staff that is there so that you make sure you're really getting the, the best bang for the buck. Um, if you're looking at new technology, 
you ask to see where it's been installed for a few years, and again, you interview the owner and the maintenance staff. Um, in my mind, being first might be fun, but it's probably a better option for the government um, to be third or fourth to get a system. So again, the third thing you think about when designing a sustainable building are things with moving parts, and it is you're very careful and judicious about that selection. The same thing with renewable equipment. You know, I mentioned as we started that oftentimes people get really excited about a project and the first thing out of their mouth is, gee, what renewable um, technology are you going to use in your building? Well, if you do everything else right, what you're re relying on for the renewable is probably 5, 10, 15 percent of what the original load would have been. Um, so you're very judicious in how you select this equipment. You do a life cycle comparison to compare alternatives. And I would add to be leery of um, features that have long paybacks, features that are over 15 years, and I, I just picked that as a number, but it seemed quite kind of good. You know, <coughs> most um, there's a couple reasons for being a little bit leery of that. If you have a payback period of 15 years and a lifespan of 20, but the manufacturer only offers a 15-year warranty, that feature is probably not a good gamble. If it's a renewable technology that's new on the block and it has a 15-year payback, maybe if we waited another five, we could get an even better um, technology with a shorter um, payback. Another thing to think about is payback is often based on the modeled energy savings um, that assumes a certain level of performance for the material and a certain level of maintenance that we as the government are going to perform. Uh, it might start out at those levels or it might start out a little worse and then we typically don't perform the maintenance that we need to and a product is really as good on its latter days as it is on the first day of service. So I would just, that means that your payback, which was estimated at 15 years using the modeled energy savings, might actually end up being longer than that in reality. And then um, lastly, uh, just to watch what the manufacturer offers in, in warranty periods, because if they're not willing to warranty uh, an item then for a long period of time, then our payback should definitely be underneath where that that warranty is. Um, I've heard people talk about it and it is possible to use paybacks that match the anticipated lifespan of the building. It is permissible under policies. I'd be a little leery of that too. Uh, if you think about it from um, an army-wide perspective, uh, having that feature that takes 40 years to pay back, um, we might be able as a whole entity in DOD to use the money just a little better on a little different project or on another feature of your building. And that's why I propose always using life cycle cost analysis to see what is the lowest life cycle cost um, to compare alternatives. And lastly, just don't be mesmerized by the technology. What you see at a convention that is great and new today will be bypassed as old technology in a few years and will be on to something even more new and wonderful. So I'm proposing, and, and this is sort of the, the thought, and maybe I don't see many questions. I thought I'd get comments from everybody telling me, no, I was out drinking something really good for lunch. But I would propose for a sustainable building, what you do is step one, two, and three. So you do what costs nothing and has a, an impact. You do what costs a little and has a huge impact. And then you're very judicious with those items that fall into step three so that we get projects that are really sustainable for the Army, for DOD, and actually for the government overall. And gracious, questions, comments? Oh, and I put on here on slide 24 the um, platinum um, projects that we have in the Army, uh, the Wilderness Road Complex, the Community Emergency Services Center at Port Bragg, uh, the Fitness Center at Tyndall, which was done for the Air Force, which is a customer, and then one of our housing projects, so this was actually done by a contractor, but the Fairfax Village of Fort Beauvoir, to ask you, you know, these are great projects, wonderful projects, you know, are they truly sustainable? And compare them to steps one, two, and three. Lindsay, that's it.
that, that was great. Well, we have one question so far. Uh, this is from John Anderson who asks, with the open competition requirements, how do we select a manufacturer with a good, long, proven track record and hope and have any hope of getting that without getting stringent? Um, getting so stringent that we end up with a sole source. Is there any option for making that uh, kind of viability? Well, um, obviously we have to write the, you know, the requirements in the RFP, but I would um, propose that as we go forward and as we ask our buildings to be more and more sustainable and more and more energy and water conscious, that actually we probably need to go back to more in-house design. That'll probably bid well for the folks at the districts uh, that are looking for some in-house design to keep them busy. But I think I think it is better to put a lot of thought into it, to perhaps do those um, projects in-house so that we can go out and select and, and do better. Um, of course, on in-house designs, you still have specifications that you have to find three manufacturers that fit the requirements, but it's a, a little better. Um, I would also propose that those in-house designs help our own employees hone their skills better. So I think from a sustainability standpoint, having our folks do in-house designs is the way to go and would push for more Milcon in-house. Well, great. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any other class minute questions that they want to get in? I was waiting for Rich Snyder to argue with me. <laughs> He's probably sending emails. <laughs> probably will. Uh, well, if we don't have any other questions, um, Paula is available at USACE headquarters. Um, you can contact me for her, her information. Uh, and we'll have this presentation recorded and uploaded to our website by the end of the week. And I will throw in a plug. We are having a webinar next week. We'll be on the MDMS metering program. Uh, it's presented by uh, Michael Gabe, uh, who works for the Huntsville Center out of the Corps of Engineers. So thanks, everybody, for your participation. And I appreciate your time. Thank you.